Well, uh, our speaker today is Dr. Joe Merchant. Dr. Merchant is an internist and the hematologist oncologist, a member of the Department of Hematology Oncology at McFarland, and really in a uh, frequent uh, contributor to Grand Rounds. Uh, he's here uh, uh, to discuss, I think, a, a very timely topic, uh, one that uh, a conundrum that I'm faced with nearly on a daily basis, and that would be uh, screening for prostate cancer. So please uh, welcome Dr. Joe Merchant. Thank you. Can everybody hear me okay? Okay. Um, well, thank you, Steve. Uh, Steve asked me to uh, present on this topic about six months ago. And uh, it's just, at that time, we were starting to get some inkling about the US Preventative Services Task Force changing their recommendation about PSA screening. Um, they had put out a, a sort of a proposed new guideline last October, and, and then this uh, summer they finalized their guideline, and it's going to be published in the Annals of Internal Medicine. It's already been published online, but it'll be published in their July 17th issue. So um, I think patients are aware through uh, uh, the media that this change has come about and um, are asking all of us questions about, should I have my PSA uh, test? Um, many of you are probably getting those questions. So uh, this is a, a hopefully going to be an in-depth exploration of the PSA test, um, evidence for its use and against its use, and some of the reasons why the uh, Preventive Service Task Force has changed the recommendation. Let's see. Where's Jason? Maybe I need to. Okay, so um, the um, this is a self sort of self-explanatory statement. All screening programs do more harm, or do some harm. Some do good as well, and of these, some do more good than harm at a reasonable cost. Did it work? Okay. Um, so uh, PSA screening recommendations in 1993, right around when I finished medical school, it was really easy. They, uh, there was a broad consensus that men at age 50 should come in every year and have their PSA tested and should have an annual uh, digital rectal exam and period, end of story, everybody. Um, Associated with that, in the institution of PSA testing, which came about in around the late 1980s, the mortality from prostate cancer has dropped 4% per year, roughly, on a predictable basis since then. And um, about, you know, some of that drop in mortality is related to improvements in therapy, you know, that we're treating people better, smarter, with better medicine. But about half, or 45 to 70%, is estimated to be from earlier detection of, of prostate cancer uh, from PSA screening. So prior to PSA screening, the majority of, as you can imagine, the majority of prostate cancer was detected on, uh, based on symptoms. Men would come in with blood in their urine or, or problems urinating, um, or perhaps they were found to have a nodule or an abnormality on prostate exam as part of a complete physical. Um, and just to kind of indicate currently in, this, in, in terms of broad acceptance of the value of PSA testing, despite the US Preventive Service Task Force recommendations, it's estimated that 90% of United States urologists and 75% of United States physicians, male of course, have their PSA tested uh, on a regular basis, at least those over 50. So broadly accepted, seemingly effective recommendations, but then this is the recommendation from the United States Preventive Service Task Force. They recommended stop doing it, don't do it on anybody, and their basic rationale is that it does more harm than good. Um, and they go into quite a bit of detail in terms of this. They say that uh, false positive PSA testing is a big problem, a lot of men end up having referral for unnecessary biopsy. They say that we're over-diagnosing a lot of prostate cancers that would, would otherwise uh, not be 
important in, in the man's life, that, they, that, they, they, that, that a man could just live with this cancer, not know about it, and, and not, not uh, have any harm from that. And then they comment uh, about the, the harms of treatment for prostate cancer, whether it be a radical prostatectomy or radiation therapy, the harms from treatment are thought to be pretty, pretty substantial. They also uh, question that there's actually any evidence that early detection and treatment of prostate cancer improves overall survival. So it's a real kind of uh, in-your-face uh, uh, article recommendation saying basically everything you're doing is, is wrong. Um, just a, one brief comment, I think many of you already know the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force is, is a, an independent group. It's primarily uh, draws on the expertise of um, researchers, primary care specialists, um, and this particular uh, task force looking at PSA screening did not involve any radiation oncologists or urologists or medical oncologists, and that's by design. This is an, the, the group is intending to look at the evidence in a very dispassionate way, trying to avoid, you know, inbuilt biases and preferences. If we look at prostate cancer like an iceberg, I think the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force doesn't deny that there's this group of clinically important cancers at the top. And then there's this group of cancers under the surface that in the course of a normal man's life will never make them sick. And what they're saying is that PSA testing, that we're catching a bunch of these cancers, more, more cancers by far that are, that are unnecessary to know about than, than the clinically important cancers. And that all of these men, through the process of having biopsies, through the process of having radiation therapy unnecessarily or prostatectomy unnecessarily, these men are being harmed. Therefore, the harms outweigh the risk. A number of men, if we look carefully at autopsy, will have prostate cancer at autopsy who have died of other unrelated causes. So prostate cancer, as I think you all know, is, is very common. It represents the number, uh, let's see, these are estimated let me see if I, did I skip a slide? No. So prostate cancer is very common. 25% of 2009 cancers were prostate cancer, the number one cancer in men. So this recommendation really applies to a lot of men. Um, the number of deaths from prostate cancer is the number two cause of death in men uh, just after uh, lung cancer. As you can see from this slide, that this is incidence over time starting in 1972 and going, this is up to 2000. Prostate cancer is here in blue. Around the mid to late 1970s, urologists started doing a procedure called TERP where they uh, used a, uh, a surgical device to clear out a larger a tract for men who were suffering from obstruction of their urine. And by doing that, they found some prostate cancers. So there was a rise in incidence associated with the initiation of, of the TERP surgery. And then there's been a huge rise in incidence of prostate cancer since about the late 1980s, when PSA testing was, was um, uh, started to be in common use. PSA testing, the first description of testing of PSA in the serum was 1980 in, uh, in, a, in a research lab. So associated with this increase in the incidence, the age at which prostate cancer is diagnosed has dropped from about 71 or 70 down to about 67 now. And you can see that after diagnosing a whole bunch of cases in men who previously weren't being screened, now the incidence has dropped down to a different level because we've kind of captured all of these cases that were clinically uh, silent except uh, that they were found by screening tests. So this is the PSA, this is about here, is about the new baseline or steady state for prostate cancer. The man's risk um, currently of dying, or of uh, developing prostate cancer is about one in six lifetime. Um, and I think one of the things that I just wanted to throw on this slide about to, to, to raise the whole issue in your minds of, of lead time bias, 
the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force is saying that, sure, you're catching all these cancers with PSA, but you're catching them here now instead of when they develop symptoms. So the man now knows they have cancer for five or six years, um, or sorry, the man is, is detected clinically. If, if we left it to, clin just to symptoms, they would be detected here, and they would survive this long. And if we uh, use PSA, we move up the detection by a few years, but they live just as long. So the PSA testing detects cancers early but doesn't prolong survival. That's sort of the argument of, of one of the main critics or criticisms of PSA testing. So they're kind of questioning uh, whether PSA improves survival. This is the trends in death rates for patients with different cancers. And you can see if you look at prostate cancer here, there was kind of a rise in death rate in the late 1970s prior to an 80s. That's prior to the development of PSA testing. Really, people don't know why that was. But since around 1992, there's been a steady decline in PSA in prostate cancer mortality. And it's hard to believe that all of that, you know, it's just lead time bias and things like that. Fewer people are physically dying of cancer. Um, this is uh, our five-year relative survival rates with different cancers. And you can see prostate cancer in 1975, only two-thirds of men would live five years. Whereas in uh, 2004, now almost 100% of men can be predicted to live five years, largely because of improved therapy, um, uh, not all because of early detection. Although you can imagine that detecting your cancer at age 67 instead of at age 71 might lend itself to more successful uh, therapy, even if it's not curative. So the epidemiology of prostate cancer, and I just show this because I wanted to highlight the difference here between black Americans and, and white Americans, or really other races. Black Americans have a much higher incidence of prostate cancer and almost or more than double the mortality of any other group, uh, any other ethnic group. And you can see that American Indians and Asians have a, a much lower rate of prostate cancer than, than Caucasians do. So many people have commented that, well, you know, the American or the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force in, doesn't include any special provision for uh, screening high-risk populations, including uh, black Americans, even though there's this doubling of death rate and much higher incidence, which is hard to, hard to ignore. When do men get prostate cancer? This is a breakdown by decade, showing that there's a, a large number of men who are still in their fit and active working lives who are diagnosed with prostate cancer in their late 50s, early 60s. You know, uh, although it is a cancer of age, uh, older men, it still has an, uh, an effect on the mid-50s age group. Um, these are the risk factors for prostate cancer. Age is really the number one, but family history also predisposes with about 5 to 10 percent of cases being due to um, uh, genetic syndromes, including uh, a syndrome that we often associate with breast cancer, the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. Um, men with those mutations have a higher risk of, of prostate cancer. Black race, we talked about. White males have about a 16% lifetime risk. Black males have a higher risk and a higher risk of death. The natural history. Um, in the U.S., 90% of cases now are diagnosed because of PSA screening. When diagnosed, the prostate cancer currently is limited to the prostate in about 85% of cases. And after introduction from PSA screening, the lifetime risk of a man being diagnosed with prostate cancer did go up from about 9% to 17%. The majority of men with prostate cancer uh, are diagnosed still after the age of 65 and die from other, other causes. These are some autopsy studies showing that a high number of men are found to have prostate cancer at the time of their autopsy if you look at, look for it. And, um, you know, this again raises the question of are we finding too many prostate cancers? Are we looking too hard? If you look at what happens to men with prostate cancer in this country, the majority of men are treated. 
So 90% of men diagnosed in this particular study, which we'll talk about more, 92% in this particular study. Again, this is <clears throat> the United States. This is how we take care of cancer in the US. And here it's broken down into the type of therapy, brachytherapy, uh, brachytherapy plus external beam therapy, external beam radiation, radical prostatectomy, or androgen uh, deprivation therapy, or watchful waiting. So the watchful waiting group, this dark purple group, you can see is really the minority of, of, uh, of approaches that physicians take to prostate cancer therapy in this country. And the majority of men who are t diagnosed with prostate cancer, the, the, um, the result is let's do something about it, you know, either because the physician recommends it or because the patient wants it. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about prostate cancer grading because um, the, the, the grading for prostate cancer is, comes into, into play a little bit later. And I'm glad J Jamie's here um, in my talk. Grading is a way of describing the aggressiveness or the appearance of aggressiveness of the cancer. And there's a, a, a panel or a, pro, uh, a system called Gleason scoring that um, comes into play in, in prostate cancer. And I just wanted to kind of go over that briefly. The Gleason scale, uh, I don't know when it was developed, quite a long time ago, I imagine, but um, it was, it, it, what they do is the pathologist will look at the cancer, either on a biopsy or at a prostatectomy sample, and they will, they will grade the two most prominent, two most, uh, prominent uh, areas of the cancer, usually the cancer, prostate cancers, uh, have um, a different look um, in different areas of the prostate gland. As you can see, as the cancer loses its, loses its similarity to normal prostate tissue, the Gleason score gets higher. So if we look at a Gleason score three cancer, and I took this from, from an article, I hope, hope you agree, uh, Jamie, but this is a Gleason three cancer, still making glands. A Gleason 4 cancer becomes, starts to look busier and a little bit more nasty. And a Gleason 5 cancer has a, a, an undifferentiated appearance that uh, is, is simply just more aggressive in appearance. The reason I wanted to go over this is that the survival, the, the chance of dying of prostate cancer uh, is quite different based on the Gleason score. And so if you look at the group in the 8 to 10, again, the pathologist will grade the two most prominent areas. So you'll end up with a, a score of perhaps 4 in one area and 5 in another, or 3 in one area and 4 in another. And so the Gleason score is the, uh, the sum of those two numbers. If you have a Gleason score of 8 to 10, your, your risk of uh, death from prostate cancer is much higher than uh, lower um, uh, 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 risk. So there is a, uh, well, let me see. No, this is just the, the Gleason score and the, the number of people who are diagnosed at that grade. So about 14% um, of men are diagnosed with the high grade cancer, and, uh, and uh, the majority, 46%, are diagnosed at a low grade cancer. Um, some other factors that are coming into play in deciding how to take care of prostate cancer is uh, a d d Diamico high-risk pathology features. At a prostatectomy, these are defined as extracapsular extension, seminal vesicle invasion, positive margins, Gleason score of greater than seven. And then at a, at a PSA or at a prostate biopsy needle sample, you can divide low-risk, intermediate-risk, high-risk uh, features. And again, the Gleason score, the initial PSA, the percent of positive cores, um, comes into play in deciding or telling or informing a man, well, this cancer is a low-risk cancer or this cancer is a high-risk cancer or an intermediate-risk cancer. And uh, this kind of information is very useful in um, helping physicians inform men of how to, how to go about taking care of their cancers. One could imagine taking care of low-risk cancers with watchful waiting and intermediate and high-risk cancers more with a curative approach, for example. Here's the slide I thought I had earlier. This is the 10-year prostate cancer-specific mortality um, in 12,000 patients. 
15-year prostate cancer-specific mortality. Again, looking at Gleason 6, 7, and 8 through 10, and the, the prostate cancer-specific mortality at 10 years is only 2% if you have a 6, but it's 15% with an 8, uh, or at 15 years, 34%. So a man who has a prostate cancer of six, a PSA of, or a Gleason score of six, probably should just not be as worried as a man with, with a Gleason score of eight, uh, and may, may quite reasonably take a conservative approach to their cancer. Prostate cancer staging, I, I was supposed to include some discussion about that. Um, there are regular updates in the prostate cancer staging. If we are diagnosing a cancer, um, there is a system for uh, designated by the American Joint Commission on Cancer Staging, and I want to just go through it briefly. Stage one is cancer, as you can imagine, limited to the prostate, and is divided into uh, these, these uh, tumor stages, PSA less than 10, Gleason score less than or equal to 6. And then stage two is a cancer uh, with a higher, either PSA is higher, um, or the Gleason score, um, let's see, yeah, PSA greater than 10, a bigger cancer, stage 2B, um, Gleason score, you can have a small cancer with a high Gleason score, um, or a high PSA. So the things that go into staging cancers include the PSA, include the size of the cancer, and include the Gleason score. Stage 3 cancers are cancers that involve either the bladder neck, or the seminal vesicles and any Gleason score. And then stage four cancers are those that have metastasized to other organs um, or to lymph nodes. I'm gonna kind of forward through these, but I wanted to bring up, a, a, to, because a lot of the criticism of the US Preventive Service Task Force of PSA testing it relates to the fact that we don't do a very good job of of curing men of cancer with our curative approaches. I wanted to introduce some of the data that they, that they base that on. This is a trial called the PIVOT trial, and it's from Europe. It um, was initiated in 1994. This is early in the PSA era. So these are men who are diagnosed with prostate cancer based on the PSA test, usually. There were 5,000 men eligible. Um, they had trouble getting men to agree to be randomized, e even in Europe. Um, you know, only 14% of men agreed to let a flip of the coin decide whether their prostate cancer is surgically removed on the one hand or left alone in the other hand. So you can imagine pres being presented with that as a, as a choice yourself. Um, hard for men to agree. So they only got 14% to agree, but still 730 men randomly assigned to prostatectomy or observation. And the groups were equally matched in terms of their characteristics. These were um, men usually in their late 60s. And the, the tumor characteristics were also pretty equally matched when you looked at them. About 8%, a relatively low percentage were high-grade uh, cancers in this particular trial. Relative, the minority had high-risk uh, pathology features. And they have follow-up now of about 10 years, and the all-cause mortality for, for all men is 48%. The, for all patients, the prostate cancer-specific mortality is 7%. And then if you break it down by risk category, the, the risk is higher for men with high-risk features. This is the uh, mortality rate. Again, the, the uh, blue patients had their cancers left alone. They were just left in their bodies. They were, they were not taken out. The, the red patients in this trial were, were, uh, had a prostatectomy here. And you can see that there's no difference in survival um, uh, based on treatment. But if you break down the risk into tumor attributes, you can start to determine that men with a high-risk cancer really are better off treated with surgery. Men with low-risk cancer have no benefit or even harm from surgery. So, you know, a reasonable uh, interpretation of this data is that 
that there is a benefit from surgery for a selected population of patients. And you can see this if you start to look at subgroups of the data. These are men with PSA at diagnosis more than 10. There is a, um, a lower uh, risk of failure in men who have prostatectomy. And here is a high risk pathology features. Again, lower risk of failure or progression to death. And your risk is quite a bit lower, 60% lower with prostatectomy. There's a lower risk that you'll go on to develop bone metastasis if you have surgery. And if you look at um, measures of quality of life, there's a similar quality of life, really. There's a decline over time in the observation group that's very similar to the um, radical prostatectomy group. And this is a mental decline uh, similar in both groups. So really not not so much of a quality of life decline in men with prostatectomy compared to observation. So this is a, one of the biggest trials that looks at the value of radical prostatectomy in the PSA era. If you look at adverse events of surgery, about 21% will have an adverse event, only one perioperative death in this trial. These are later adverse events for the men who receive prostatectomy versus observation. Uh, erectile dysfunction, 81%. Sexual dissatisfaction, 61%. Bowel, bowel problems, 12%. Urinary incontinence, all more than the observation group. Some in the observation group have the same problems. So there have been other studies of curative therapy for prostate cancer. Um, there's a, this, is, this study here is uh, Scandinavian prostate cancer group. Study number four, this is from kind of before the PSA era, and in this trial, uh, 695 men, early prostate cancer, randomly assigned to prostatectomy versus observation. And to get in the trial, you had to have these characteristics, PSA less than 50, you had to have a life expectancy of more than 10 years, you had no other cancer, and a relatively early prostate cancer at, uh, on exam. And at 15 years of follow-up, the prostatectomy patients had an almost 40% decline in prostate cancer mortality and 25% reduction in all-cause mortality. Um, and I just show this because you can see that the prostate cancer death rate in men under 65, there were 25 deaths compared to 49 deaths. So there does seem to be um, a, quite a bit of difference between this group and this group here but there's less of a difference in the older men, um, less of a difference. This is a really hard slide for people to read, but it's probably worth going over. And just mainly because this line looks at men in the over age 65 group, and this line looks at the men under age 65, this line looks at all men. And what they're looking at here is the probability of death from any cause, death from prostate cancer, and metastasis. And the watchful waiting group is the light gray and prostatectomy group, the dark black. And in this trial, you, I mean, you can see that um, the older men, there's very little change, prostatectomy or, or, or no, or watchful waiting. But at the under age 65 group, there does seem to be a clear separation and a, a clear benefit from, from prostatectomy. Um, uh, so this is, again, published data looking at trying to find, well, who really should we be treating in an aggressive way for prostate cancer? Seems that it's probably younger men with aggressive high, high Gleason score cancers uh, that would benefit the most from that treatment. What happens to men if we just leave them alone? So we saw a couple in these two trials the observation group has a relatively low risk of dying of prostate cancer. This is a trial looking in the United States at evidence from the SEER database where uh, 17 states, you know, keep very careful outcomes data about their cancers and uh, other health outcomes. And so they found a cohort of about 14,000 men, median age, kind of old, 78. 77% of the men, or so these were stage one, T2, or sorry, T1 or T2 cancers diagnosed in this time period. They had to be over the 65, and they had to not receive any attempted curative therapy. 
Um, Seventy-seven percent in their cohort had a low Gleason score. Forty-two percent were treated with androgen therapy within six months of diagnosis. So these men were, were not really exactly just left alone. Uh, a large number of them were uh, castrated either chemically or surgically. And the 10-year prostate cancer specific mortality in this group was low, it was only 8%. The risk of dying from other cancers was 60%. So this kind of data that might be helpful for an older man who's been diagnosed with prostate cancer to be able to say, you know, if we leave this alone, really your chance of dying of something else is on the order of eight to 10 times higher than dying of this cancer. And this is a, I included this mainly because I, I think if, if, if I, you know, advising a man, this is kind of stuff that would be very helpful. You can say if you have a moderately differentiated cancer and you're 70, your risk of dying something else in gray here over time is much higher than your risk of dying of the dark gray, which is the cancer, prostate cancer. So your prostate cancer specific mortality is dark gray, light gray is is the non-prostate cancer mortality. And it's broken down by uh, moderately differentiated and then the high Gleason score cancers. You can see, you start seeing a lot more of the dark gray. These are the cancers that really cause men to die, more, much more likely to cause men to die or to need uh, chemotherapy or other treatments that they would get from me, for example. So I think many of you already know that tr radical prostatectomy, and I mentioned some of the side effects, and radiation therapy um, can cause uh, uh, morbidity, can cause problems for men in terms of incontinence, impotence, in terms of perioperative mortality. Um, hormonal therapy for prostate cancer will also cause problems in terms of uh, uh, impotence and sexual, sexual problems, depression, fatigue, muscle weakness. So what is a PSA? Getting back to the original point of the talk, PSA is a glycoprotein. It has a number of other names. Its purpose is uh, to liquefy the semen, to make it possible for the sperm to have normal motility. It also um, seems to have an effect on uh, dissolving cervical mucus to improve the chance of uh, uh, fertilization. It's interesting to me, I didn't know this, that PSA is also found in female ejaculate. It's found in breast milk, amniotic fluid, salivary glands. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a common protein. And you can measure it as a quote unquote tumor marker in some women with uterine cancer, kidney cancer, um, breast cancer. So it's not a male, male protein uh, only. It's a, it's a, it's a common uh, protein also called a cal calocrine 3. If you look at what percentage of men get the PSA test currently, you can see if you look at all men, about 58%. Um, this is by year, 2001, 2, 3, 4. If you look at less than a high school education, similar to a lot of things, they get less PSA testing. And if you have no health insurance, there's, no, there's very few uh, tests. And this is the digital rectal exam, often done at the same visit that the PSA is done. So roughly same, the same kind of uh, numbers. If you look at what is the normal PSA in a man who just gets a test, who doesn't have cancer, this is kind of what happens. The older the man gets, the PSA goes up. And the volume of the prostate of the man also gets bigger. This is just nature, and um, this is what, uh, why some people say that having the same normal range for PSA testing for all age men is, is sort of not, should probably not be the correct way we go about it. There could be a lower uh, a normal range for young men, and maybe, the high, maybe for a 79-year-old, normal PSA goes up, to, goes up to 7 or 10 or something like that in order to uh, reduce the number of false positive PSA tests. Um, if you look again, this is a different study looking at, um, this is um, looking at what is the normal range by age. You get slightly different numbers, but again, the, the pattern is the same. They go up by age. Um, and this is an unscreened population of men who had five consecutive blood samples in a colon cancer polyp prevention trial. 
I raise these next three slides just to show that if you have a man who has an abnormal PSA, there's a pretty good chance that if you repeat the test, it's going to go back down. So this is men who have a PSA in this same study, 972 men, they just had five blood tests, and a decade later they went back and said, well, what was their PSA each year? And um, so they found these men were not screened for prostate cancer specifically. About 172 of the men out of 900 will have an abnormal PSA test. 154 of them return the next year for their test again. And of those, uh, 46 or 30 percent will go back to normal. And you can see if you define PSA abnormal as greater than 2.5, the, uh, the similar pattern happens. So, so a large number of men uh, left to their own devices, the PSA will go down by itself. And this is why it's, it's strongly recommended that if you have a patient with a PSA test that's high, you should at first just repeat the test, get, give them several weeks off. Some advise treating for prostatitis or treating for assumed prostatitis or infection and repeating the test. So very reasonable not to, not to refer immediately uh, upon one abnormal PSA, and I think many, many people already uh, practice that way. So if you look at an initial abnormal PSA return to normal at any subsequent visit, if you, if you get more, if you just allow more time, two or three years to pass, there's an even higher chance, 40, now 44% chance, that it'll go back to normal. And then this is uh, participants who had one abnormal and then two in a row abnormals after that, um, number of participants with level remaining normal on two consecutive tests. So an, a, a number will have, um, uh, uh, go back to normal and stay normal. So PSA screening, why do, uh, why do the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force say that it's not any good anymore? This is one of the studies that they base that on, the PLCO study. These are the patients in the study, uh, the age group recommended. This is the prostate, lung, colorectal, rectal, and ovarian cancer study. And what they did with this study is they, they, they had one group that was screened with annual PSA and another group that was called usual practice. The problem, and I'm just going to raise this right from the beginning, is that in this study, uh, in both groups, the screening group and in the control group, 35% uh, roughly, 34%, had had the PSA test once. And 10% almost had had it more than once. So this was an American population, and these men, a third of them, had already been screened for prostate cancer and found by PSA testing not to have it. So by virtue of just that introductory bias, the, the group as a whole has a lower risk of prostate cancer. And I raise that because this is one of the main studies that the Preventive Service Task Force based their recommendation on. So again, this is a study not of men who had never been screened before, but of men, of men who had been screened before. Furthermore, the test, I'll just go over it. This is the group, a big study. Um, so 38,000 men screened. And in the study, after seven years of follow-up, the control group and the, the study group, the men who got screened and the men who didn't get screened had no difference in cumulative uh, number of deaths. So the conclusion is that PSA testing doesn't do any good. However, the, um, the, the, a few details are probably worth noting. One is that this was a study mostly of low-risk prostate cancer. A relatively small number of men had eight to ten cancers. Um, in the screening group and in the control group. Um, so that the, um, you know, and perhaps that's a bias introduced by the fact that these men, about a third of them or more, more had been screened once or multiply before entering the trial. So there was another trial, uh, the, this is from Europe. This trial did show a mortality benefit from PSA testing this is kind of a strange trial, however. It's done in seven countries, and um, each country had a slightly different way of doing things. Um, each country had a different level that they called abnormal PSA. Each country had a different interval between screening. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a very ad hoc kind of study 
not as systematic as perhaps we would like. However, the important thing about this study to point out is that in the, in the US study, 40% or so had been previously screened. In this study, very few men had been previously screened. And in the US study, um, the, I should say the usual practice group, about 50% of the men in the usual practice group did get PSA testing compared to 100% in the screen group. In this group, the usual practice group, in this study, the men who were in this control group did not get PSA testing. So another big study, 180,000 patients, and they did show in this study that there was a survival benefit from uh, 326 prostate cancer deaths compared to 214. And again, more for your interest reading later, but this breaks it down the deaths from prostate cancer by age, and especially where I think they were able to show that in the younger, the younger age groups, the 55, 60 to 64, there was a, a drop in, in uh, death rates um, with screening. So in this study, they had a much higher incidence of Gleason, higher Gleason cancers, probably because they were using the PSA test in a way that it was being used in the mid-1980s or late 1980s in this country, that is in a group of patients who had never had a PSA test um, and were, were uh, basically unscreened. So you were catching these high-risk cancers, whereas in the US PLCO trial, those high-risk cancers had already been found, those patients had been disposed of, and we were doing the screening test on, a, on the remainder, the, the low-risk patients. Um, so false positives um, is a problem, and, and, and certainly a number of men will have a PSA test, it will be high, and they won't be found to have cancer. One thing I wanted to point out, the false positive rate is about 12 to, to 18 percent. If you have one false positive, there's a higher risk you're going to have another false positive. So that if you have a, one false positive, you're going to have a 50 percent chance that the next test will be false positive. But also, if you have one, quote, false positive, your risk of subsequently developing a prostate cancer is, is, a, is about quadruple the uh, risk of a man who has who has uh, no false positive. So this suggests that perhaps that if we had really more reliable uh, diagnostic technology, more reliable uh, uh, biopsy um, methods, perhaps we would be finding these cancers and that these are, some of these false positives are just missed cancers. One thing about it is if you have a false positive and later are found to have a prostate cancer, uh, more than 90% are indolent or slow-moving cancers. So these are some of the harms of PSA screening. Uh, these are from harms of biopsy, urinary uh, retention, or blood in the sperm or in the urine. And this is harms of, uh, of biopsies, complications of biopsies uh, within 30 days compared to a control. C certainly some men have problems from biopsies. These are risks of hospitalization from biopsies. So the whole idea of screening everybody, doing biopsies every year, this, there's a real cost to this. And it's a cost in terms of financial cost, and there's a cost for men's health. A number of men who are screened and, quote, cured would do every bit as well if never screened. This is the whole argument of the US Preventive Service Task Force. These are the men who have a, perhaps a PSA 6 cancer diagnosed at age 70, who undergo prostatectomy and are quote unquote cured, they would say that man really was never going to die of cancer. That man is never going to be sick of cancer. You've just now he's impotent and he, he can't he has to wear a pad and, and smells of urine everywhere he goes. So that's the argument. They're saying that a large number of these cancers that we find by screening uh, really are un, uh, don't need to be found, and that that uh, the men. Um, who, who aren't screened really would do just as well. So some, and I, I'm, this is my slide, but some would say that this, this epidemic of prostate cancer is a, quote, pseudo-epidemic, that if we didn't do testing, if we just forgot magically about the PSA test, that there would be no, no real harm done. And part of that is based on the fact that the death rate 
you know, this massive spike in cancer, the death rate here on this slide looks pretty flat. But I showed you earlier, the death rate really is coming down from prostate cancer. So uh, it's a kind of a, I think, a selective view of history here, but it's hard to argue with a number of trials that show the benefit of PSA testing is, is small. I've tried to point out to you some of the problems with the methodology of those trials. The United States trial had a large number of men in the control group who, who, who did get PSA testing from their doctor during the, during the study, even though they were supposedly not getting PSA testing. The European trial was problematic because the interval between tests was quite broad and the methodology was all over the place. So these are perhaps some of the benefits, reduced risk of death from cancer, reassurance, some of the harms, um, false reassurance, um, you know, we've taken care of your cancer, um, detection of a non-lethal cancer, sometimes we find a cancer that doesn't do any good, harms of tests, harms of uh, false alarms, men who are told they might have cancer get worried, their wives get worried. So this is the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force thinking on this in one slide. They're saying we're saving perhaps one man in a thousand, but we're causing about 120 false positives in a thousand. About 110 out of a thousand will have a prostate cancer diagnosis, but only one death. And then all of these bad things happen um, in a higher number of patients than are actually saved. That's based on the two studies, the U.S. Preventive Services, the PLCO study, the European study, neither of which perfect. Um, statistical kind of modeling based on the same data would predict that there is a group of patients that you can pick out that would benefit from therapy, that would benefit and gain in life expectancy. And here's this, the largest benefit in dark blue. Again, it's this core group of younger men who have a higher grade cancer and they would benefit from radiation or prostatectomy or any kind of curative therapy. Whereas the, the men with the lower grade cancer, the older age groups, they really have no benefit. So some positive alter possible alternatives. Um, I, I bring up this data because I think this is really kind of cool, the data. This is from Sweden, so it doesn't apply to every ethnic group. But what they did in Sweden, they did blood tests on a broad uh, group of men, um, multiple age groups, in around 1980. And then they just left the men alone. The men were not screened for prostate cancer. There's no program of PSA testing in Sweden over the ensuing 25 years. A national health system, they were able to get complete data on what happened. And uh, so in the mid-2000s, they said, well, let's go and look at that blood that we collected and, and see what happened. So 14, these are men who were 33 to 50 when they gave the blood. 1,400 of them went on to have prostate cancer. And this is the, the proportion of the population, the PSA at baseline, and uh, the pr predicted probability. This is what the PSA is at age 33 to 50. And uh, the thin, thick blue line is any prostate cancer. Thick, the red line is a palpable cancer. Thick black line is an advanced cancer. So you could pick a PSA, say, of one at, at age 44, age 50, and you could say your risk of developing a prostate cancer at, uh, in the next 25 years is 10%. So I'm just pointing this out because um, you know, a single PSA test at age 50 perhaps, would be a very effective way of stratifying patients into who needs screening and who really could, perhaps every year, and who could have a, a PSA test done every decade. You know, really a big divergence. If you look, um, the majority of um, the absolute risk of subsequent prostate cancer, 79% had a PSA, uh, a PSA less than, or sorry, more than 0.6. So you can pick out who's going to get cancer and ignore the people who have a, a, a PSA below the median, perhaps, at that younger age group. And just the same kind of data, looking at any prostate cancer, what you can find the median, the, the PSA of anything less than 0.63, perhaps, don't, don't do PSA testing on them as much, and 
really focus on these men who have a high PSA for unknown reasons at age 50. Those might be the men to really say, well, you know, we're kind of worried about you. We're going to do whatever, annual exams or maybe an ultrasound of your uh, prostate or get a urologist involved. We can also, you know, in the same kind of way, we can, we can f predict who's going to die of prostate cancer based on your PSA at age 45 to 49. You know, the majority of deaths are in the, peop in the patients who have the top 10 percent or a large proportion of deaths are in the, the men who have the top decile of PSA at age 45 to 49. This just makes intuitive sense. And so these would be the men, perhaps you'd say, well, your, your PSA is in the top 10 percent at age 45 to 49. Uh, you know, you, you need to be in some sort of prostate cancer prevention trial or some sort of program uh, of really intense observation. So this can also be done at age 60 with very similar, similar data, the same trial, same kind of information where if you're, P but now of course the, the number, the PSA number is higher. And so 66% occur, sorry, 66% of deaths occur in men who have a PSA over 3.4 at age 60. So again, you can, you can pick out risk groups and you can, you can have a, a very risk-based or risk based um, program of screening. This is the current recommendations, I'm kind of running out of time, but the current recommendations including the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force which would say that they all agree that there should be shared decision making between the doctor and the patient, but they, they basically say nobody should get PSA testing and then the American Urologic Association and American Cancer Society I think still have um, some PSA testing so, so let's talk about the criticisms of the U.S. Preventive Services Task Force. I'm, you know, I'm, I guess in my review, I think we can't throw out the PSA test entirely. Um, they overlooked or misinterpreted these two trials, the methodological flaws. The, the PLCO trial was not a trial of some screen, screening versus no screening. It was a trial of annual screening versus um, uh, sub, uh, maybe some, some less frequent screening, but it wasn't a trial of screening versus no screening. So the fact that it didn't show a risk and change in risk in, of death probably is, is completely irrelevant because the, um, the, real, the real trial here was between a one-year interval and a several-year interval, not some screening and no screening. The U.S. Preventive Service Task Force didn't include in their calculation of harm the fact that men who um, uh, uh, don't get screened and are later diagnosed with prostate cancer have to undergo tests, biopsies, and have uh, uh, consequences of their cancer diagnosis. Those harms weren't included in their harm calculation, and they should have been because that would have made the balance of risks and harms look a little bit more, more close. There was no consideration of high-risk populations, blacks, patients with a family history, those patients have a substantially higher risk of prostate cancer and, and they should be treated as such. Um, and there's insufficient consideration uh, really of the fact that since the initiation of PSA testing there's been this 4 percent per year drop in mortality from prostate cancer. There's also been about a 75 percent drop in the, the, the number of men who present to their doctor with widely advanced prostate cancer, you know, bony metastases and multiple metastases. So there's, there's been some, something that's happened from PSA testing that has, that has been virtuous and good, and they've just ignored that entirely. They've s said it must be some sort of freak, um, freak statistical fluke, I guess. They've also made a blanket recommendation for all ages, and they've ignored the, the possibility of using PSA testing in a smarter way, perhaps a more targeted way, to capture uh, you know, the people who really need to be screened, ignore the people who don't need to be screened. So training for uncertainty, this is just a quote. I mean, we really have to recommend, patient, recommend things to patients every day based on our own uncertainty. And, and your patients expect us to be, to be sure. And um, I think the test, the, 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 the presentation probably indicates how unsure even the experts are of, of really what 
what the best thing to do is. So here's our iceberg again. And I would just say, you know, obviously some PSA cancers are very bad. Some probably can be left alone. But the US Preventive Service Task Force alternative leads us, if we're a captain on the ship trying to guide our patients, uh, their recommendations are to have us close our eyes. So, um, so anyway, I'll leave you with that thought, and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Any Thank you for that uh, presentation. Yeah. That was excellent. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Um, I was in Chicago last week at the American Medical Association meeting, and there was a, a lengthy discussion about mammography recommendations from the USPSTF. But there was also uh, a discussion of the, the PSA screening recommendations, and many physicians are extremely concerned about the authority that's conveyed with USPSTF recommendations versus the American Urological Association or the American Cancer Society, for example. And uh, uh, many physicians stood up and expressed their concern at the methodologies. And, and as you say, uh, this, this is a test. Or this group has ignored the fact that there's been a 40% reduction in mortality, uh, but they've somehow allowed the imperfections in the two uh, large trials that were performed that didn't didn't really answer the question. I mean, it's not surprising at all that you didn't find a statistically significant difference in survival when you have screening done in both groups. It's just a completely inadequate way to address the question. And they're coming down with recommendations that then they say are based on science. And they, they take this uh, almost moral superiority posturing to constantly say, we're independent, we're not contaminated with these medical professionals from these specialties, and uh, this is just the science, just the science, just the science. And I find that offensive because they have not shown what they say they've shown. They've uh, jumped a gap. Uh, from what that science actually shows to their recommendation, which is a black and white blanket recommendation that is going to uh, deny care to uh, those who would like to have screening and inappropriate consultation with their physician determine that that's appropriate for them. And now they will not have that opportunity because it will be used as justification to deny payment for services and that sort of thing. So this is really uh, something that's upsetting many physicians around the country. And uh, I, I think you've done an excellent treatment of the subject and show both sides really fairly and presented the data on that. Um, and, and I really appreciate that. Thanks. Yeah, I think I, um, I did a grand rounds on mammogram uh, screening after they changed their re mammography screening recommendation too. And really, the the problem that I th I think that they're in is that they they are locked into the idea that <clears throat> evidence based medicine is going to solve everything. However, these screening tests um, have been developed <clears throat> and broadly broadly instituted across the country. Uh, in the absence of evidence, and then um, the trials that are available are really imperfect, and yet the, the data from those trials is treated as sacrosanct and pure data. And really, if you look at the, the trials for mammography and for the PSA tests, um, you know, these are trials that are really, really not perfect. They're not uh, showing what they say they're showing. I mean, it just makes sense if you take a group of men and you screen take men who've been screened before. I mean, I think the study from, uh, you know, if, if I go back, the, I don't know if I can go back. Um, so this study, say, for example, um, oh. so the men, these are men in the PLCO study, are men who, who were screened with PSA and they had a low PSA number. 30% of them, obviously, had a low PSA number. So they're on this, they're on this, uh, their risk of ever getting a cancer is low. So the PLCO test was done on men in this area here. All the men out here had already been weeded out, you know. So the majority, or at least 40%, roughly, of the men in the PLCO trial 
were in this, this low cohort. They were men who, who uh, the bad cancers had already been taken out. So you kind of, you took the PSA test, you put one arm behind its back and tied its ankle up above, you know, I mean, it's really made it really hard to show a benefit of PSA testing. And also, I mean, you read the article from the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, and you get the idea that prostate cancer is just this easy peasy disease and nobody ever gets sick and we're just a bunch of sort of malignant doctors out to make money. And um, I mean, there are certainly data that, I mean, it would really be better if we left more men with low-grade prostate cancer alone and just sought, thoughtfully told them that, you know, you're 75, sure you've got prostate cancer, but um, you don't really need to take care of it. You know, you don't need to do anything about it. And we, we treat too many men, and that's a legitimate criticism. And sometimes I, I really think that the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, the value of their, of their stuff is just that in-your-face shock therapy of, you know, you're doing something that's dumb, you know, some of the time at least. But the problem that people worry about is that uh, Medicare will say, now, now no PSA testing will be paid for because, because this body says so. And, you know, hopefully that won't be the case. Or insurance companies will say, well, we're not going to pay for PSA testing anymore. So that would be a loss. And I think we would see, what we would see is that the n death rate from prostate cancer would just go right back up to the, you know, 1970s or close to that. Because the age group, you can imagine, if we followed the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, 10 or 20 years from now, what age would we be finding prostate cancer? Be back to age 71 or 72, you know, if we didn't screen anybody. So, and those men are going to be sicker, they're going to have bigger cancers, more metastases. So, you know, I think the, the problem is these, the people in the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force, if they're going to be issuing such strong recommendations, they should seek probably broader input and input from people who actually take care of people with the cancer. Yeah, hi, Leo, go ahead. I, yeah, I didn't, sorry, I didn't, I wasn't sure how to, I mean, that. It's a lot more complicated than, you know, really, I mean, it's a lot more complicated than what the U.S. Preventive Task Force makes it. They don't, they don't really, um, I don't think they give full credit to all the progress that's been made in the 
treatment of the, the surgical treatment or the radiation treatment of or the medical oncology treatment although it's we're at a much you know more infantile stage of progress for prostate cancer than uh, urology and radiation is now but um, the you know the the survival I just don't think you can ignore the fact that the survival rates have gone down with the institution of PSA testing sure we could do it smarter sure we could perhaps advise patients at low risk to have less done but you know it's hard I'm sure Leo you get this guy comes in you've got prostate cancer you really think well you know it's low risk but they want it out don't they you know so they want it out and so it's it's hard so that has that gets back to what maybe you know uh, would be more useful way of the US preventive service task force is let's say educate people about low-risk prostate cancer and let doctors who know how take care of high-risk prostate cancer I mean that would be useful I think because then you you know you might get a more uh, a better listening patient or a, a wife who would understand more when you say you know this cancer really you don't need to have your prostate out for this cancer well thanks everybody